Good morning, everybody, and welcome to HistFest Day 2. Um, hello to everyone in the room and to everyone joining us at home as well. Um, I'm Sarah, I'm part of the HistFest team, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to our first talk of the day, um, Hysterical, the History and Myth of Gendered Emotions, with Pragya Agarwal and chaired by Eleanor Cleghorn. Um, just a few little housekeeping bits before we start. I know everyone who was here yesterday would have heard these before, just bear with me. Um, we'll be taking questions towards the end of the session, so if you're in the room, have a little think about what you might want to ask as we go along. Um, and the, we'll have um, handheld mics, uh, which Eleanor will kind of show pick a few people out from the audience, we'll have a handheld mic coming round. Um, for those of you at home, um, there is a question box just below your video stream. So please do submit questions throughout the talk and um, uh, Eleanor will, will pick a couple of those to read out at the end. We have the amazing booksellers from Blackwells out in the foyer. So if you're on site, um, please do um, take a look at the, at the book stand out there. Um, and online, there are some tabs, I think, underneath the video. You can buy the speaker's books. Um, both our speakers today will be doing a book signing after the talk in person. And um, just finally, the event will have live speech-to-text captioning and uh, British Sign Language interpretation as well, which uh, online you can access by a tab below the video. So, our speakers. Um, Dr. Eleanor Cleghorn is a feminist cultural historian. After receiving her PhD in 2012, Eleanor spent three years as a postdoctoral researcher at the Ruskin School, University of Oxford, working on an interdisciplinary medical humanities project. She now works as a writer and researcher and lives in Sussex. Her own pain and other symptoms were dismissed for seven years before she was finally diagnosed with lupus. Um, Unwell Women is her first book and she's currently at work on her second. The line about lupus there doesn't make any sense if you've not read Unwell Women yet, but <laughs> go and buy a copy if you, you haven't. You need to read it now, yeah. she's spoiled the end. I was also just ran randomly disclosing your medical history there. But, um, Dr. Pragya Agarwal is a professor of social inequities, behavioural and data scientist, and a founder of research think tank, uh, a research think tank investigating gender in inequities. She's the author of four widely acclaimed non-fiction books for adults on racism, gender bias and motherhood, and a picture book for raising non-racist children. Her writing has also appeared in places such as The Guardian, The Independent, New Scientist, Scientific American, Literary Hub, Willow Herb Review, and E.ON. She's been nominated as one of 50 people creating change in the India-UK corridor and one of 100 leading women in social enterprise in the UK. And she's here today to speak on her latest book, Hysterical, The Myth of Gendered Emotions. Over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, for that lovely welcome, and thank you all for coming this morning. Um, I'm really delighted to be talking to Dr. Pragya Agarwal about a fantastic new book, Hysterical, Exploding the Myth of Gendered Emotions. Um, Pragya, I'd love to start just by asking you what inspired you to explore the history and uh, sociology of how emotions have become gendered. Thank you so much, Eleanor, and such a pleasure to be here. Um, I think it's really a complex question, so there's no straight <laughs> answer to it. Um, of course, a lot of my work emerges from the personal, so personal is always political, I say in that kind of off-repeated sentiment. Um, and, and although hysterical doesn't have a lot of my story like motherhood did, it's not a memoir, it emerges from your experience of being raised in a patriarchal society and being considered too much or too sensitive or the fact being told or to conform to a certain idea of what a good girl or a woman should look like, seeing a kind of idealized notion of motherhood which is self-sacrificing. So I went through all that and especially when I was writing Sway, which was my first book about unconscious bias and then motherhood, um, I was doing a lot of research and came across a lot of archival work and research on how actually started thinking about how our emotions uh, are the root cause for gender inequality as well. And we don't often talk about it. We talk about the manifestations of it and the impact it has, but we don't talk about the kind of root cause of how uh, emotions are so gendered. Mm -hmm. um, as an academic, I had been um, working on kind of human computer interaction and developing personalized interfaces. Um, on, on how do we make them more human-centered. Mm -hmm. And I realized that 
although we were talking about human-centered technology and artificial intelligence, we weren't thinking about the emotions uh, which make us human. And the more research I did, I realized that actually emotions were kind of like considered inferior in, in academia and nobody wanted to research that. It was only in the last 50 years that researchers started to take it seriously. So it kind of all came together <laughs> in this book. So that's a long answer. Yeah, it's a great answer. I think that's really fascinating that emotions have been, you know, the sort of Cinderella of, of academic thinking. Yeah. Um, around what makes us human, around our, you know, building of ourselves. Um, just to go sort of right back to the beginnings of, you know, Western patriarchal mm. constructions of emotion and gender. Um, and of course, we're both really concerned about the ways that ideas about our bodies mm. play into these sort of social and cultural binary constructions about who we are and how we should behave. So um, we know that, and you speak about this, write about this beautifully in Hysterical, about the beginnings of some, the emotional root in, in our bodies, like where is the root of emotions in our bodies and the way that ideas about the emotions being embedded in the body have been, began to be used as sort of way of exerting social control. So I'm wondering if you could just take us back to classical Greece with the beginnings of some absurd and fantastical stories about the womb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're so absolutely right. Um, we think that emotions are detached from our, our bodies because we see the manifestation of them in terms of feelings. And there's been a whole narrative that, that um, be, the, 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 of the notion that I think there I, therefore I am. So the, the brain is the most center of what makes us human. Um, but the more research you do, and, and, and it's actually true that the Greek literature or the, the philosophers did explicitly talk about emotions, mm -hmm. but the more research you do, you realize that actually they are talking about emotional behavior and emotional codes and norms in, in very strange ways. Mm -hmm. and, and this kind of notion, idea of masculinity and femininity sets roots very, very early on with mm -hmm. Aristotle, with um, he's talking about how uh, women are cold-blooded and um, they can't handle temper or the strong emotions. And, and while men are warm and they have the capacity to handle some of the stronger emotions. Mm -hmm. And we also see that courage is associated with men and these kind of, th so there's a morality code being associated yes. with it. But in talking in terms of womb, we know that um, there was this kind of whole misconception because the female bodies were seen as kind of inferior to men. They were the, we have to understand that those were mostly men writing about these, about bodies and about medical science. So, and we see that even now that female anatomy is seen as a subset of the male anatomy. Mm -hmm. So when we look at medical textbooks now, we, we see the bodies being labeled, the perineum is a part of the female anatomy and it is the female perineum. So it's always the subset mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of the male anatomy. Um, so they were considered inferior. And so um, Hippocrates and um, other people writing at the time thought that the womb was basically just kind of flapping around in the body <laughs> and uh, just roamed around. It's called the wandering womb and it roamed around and it was the basic root of all the kind of illnesses that were associated with women. Um, and they didn't really go into any more of that except that. And so, and also there was this idea that women were very strongly associated with the reproductive mm -hmm. reproduction. So the womb was kind of a part of an identity of a wo woman because that's what makes made there were women according to them. Um, and so this, this notion that so all these idea of the women being cold blooded and fragile and not being able to handle strong emotions, but also they experience stronger emotions because they had this flapping, flapping womb and uterus wandering around. And so they were irrational and they were mm -hmm. illogical and they, they couldn't, they experienced strong spectrum of emotions, which was linked to hysterics mm -hmm. or hystericals, or his, yeah. what became as hysterical. Of course. Right? And, you know, no prizes for guessing what the cure for a wandering <laughs> womb was in ancient Greece, of course. Getting married, having lots of marital sex and being pregnant was the cure. Um, so the womb in classical medicine and classical sort of social thinking mm -hmm. 
is almost kind of coincident with the female mind. Yeah. You know, the, the, the two are strongly linked through, they believe that there was like a tube or a channel that connected the vagina to the mouth. Yeah. Yes. So there was this, they were almost sort of one organ yeah. linked, you know, so the, the reproductive function, the social function that, that uh, patriarchy wanted from their women in, in classical society was also, you know, the cure for this sort of quieting down of the body that was also the quietening down of the emotions. And there was this little short Hippocratic text called something like the disease of virgins, yeah. where they talk about very specifically about delirium and mania and hallucinations and even, you know, thoughts of self-harm or suicide in young women who aren't yet married and aren't sort of purging their bodies, like purging their menstruation. So the, the urge was to get, you know, marry and, and yeah. reproduce really quick yeah. as a cure. So, yeah, this idea that reproductive function, the social function, <coughs> patriarchal duty is the cure for this sort of unruliness yeah. is is fascinating. I know it's something that fascinates both of us. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, just moving on to one of my favourite chapters in the book, which is called Chamber Pots. <laughs> and I'm going to read out the quote from which Prague took the amazing title of this. So, you know, buckle up. Um, so this is a quote from Marsilio Ficino. I'm sorry if I bungled that. Uh, the Renaissance humanist philosopher who said, women should be used like chamber pots hidden away once a man has pissed in them. <laughs> what a gent. Um. Yeah, it was um, actually writing this book was emotionally exhausting and made me quite hysterical. So. Um, but this chapter is, is fascinating because you really explore and write beautifully about, about some of the classical mythological representations mm -hmm. of women's emotionality. And it always strikes me that in many of the Greek myths, there are some transcendent, incredible displays of female emotion, especially connected <coughs> with mothering, maternity, motherhood, both sort of positive and negative. So thinking about Demeter's, her, her rage at Persephone being uh, abducted by Hades is so intense that she, that she changes the world. You know, she makes the world succumb to a famine. That's the power of her emotion. So there are these incredible, you know, cultural representations of, of the force, world-changing, transformative force of, of women's emotions. But yet at the same time, these myths were these kind of cultural uh, cautionary tales, you know, warnings about what can happen if emotional women are allowed their own autonomy. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more also maybe about Medea, one of the yeah. most you know, notorious perhaps <laughs> representations of female emotion that we have in culture. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think um, art and literature, when you start looking, we see that how much of that is being shaped by the male gaze um, and the fact that while we talk about some of them as kind of feminist um, telling of, of the feminist narratives at the time. And, and some of them um, were actually kind of overturning some of those stereotypes um, that men uh, were more rational and stoic and logical, so they were allowed a space in the public and political domain. And, and so you have to understand that those kind of emotional norms and stereotypes also determined which space that women and men occupied, which has some of that has kind of seeped into a society even now. But even when we saw representations of ideas like rage in women, mm -hmm. which women were not allowed to show. So maternal feeling is something again linked to women's role as a reproductive kind of, um, their primary role was reproduction. And, and we have, we know that those ideas have carried on now about maternal instinct and maternal, mm -hmm. what are the, uh, and we don't see much of rage in it, uh, yes. uh, in women. Um, so Medusa or Medea, um, I, even when we, see her getting angry it is it is like a cautionary tale because she is we see that what happens when a woman gets angry is 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 harmful it's harmful to society it has really big consequences for society in terms of her killing her children or in terms of taking revenge so even when we see these kind of representations we are always seeing it, it comes with a with a notion that 
if women are allowed these emotions or if women experience or express these emotions, then it has harmful consequences for society, that it would over top will topple the social hierarchy or the codes or the norms that we have established and it'll be destabilizing for society. And in the Indian context as well, um, if you look at Indian mythology, there is a goddess called Kali, and if you're familiar with that representation, um, and most of Indian goddesses in Indian mythology are very calm and kind of um, have that with aura of like all the kind of feminine um, emotionalities. But Kali is the one who's uh, shown as this this goddess who's got who's angry and can sh and and but in her anger. Uh, although she is becomes that representation of female anger or women anger and a lot uh, and kind of a feminist representation that we grew up seeing she, it's also a cautionary because mm -hmm. she's shown um, with her consort was Lord Shiva prone in front of her and she's over stepped uh, got her leg or foot on him that in her rage she doesn't distinguish who is a friend and foe and in, in her in her in her rage she's also t harming her mm. partner and her mm. lover. So there is that kind of notion that women can't control that rage because their bodies are fragile, their bodies are cold blooded, their bodies are not strong enough to deal with this. That is why they shouldn't be allowed to have this. So it's mm. kind of an inherent paradox in there because those, those, what literature or historical texts are telling us is that women are overexcitable and they experience these strong emotions more than men because more men have more regulatory powers, yes. but women, when they experience them, it has a harmful consequence. Mm. So there is that notion that they can't control it if yeah. they experience it, they shouldn't be allowed to experience yes. it. And, yeah. yeah. Sorry, that's, that's fascinating, the story about Kali and mm. Shiva, and I was thinking about the parallels perhaps between Medea and Jason, yeah. because Jason you know, abandons and, and betrays Medea, but she is then put in a position where she has to be strategic. She has to think about how she can live, how her children can live. And then of course they do not. And the, and the way that her, what she does, her kind of her act, her transgression, um, her act of violence is, is sort of staged in, in the Euripides play as something that that removes honor or destroys Jason. Yeah. But of course, also what I always find interesting about that play, about the tragic play, is that Medea is allowed to speak out about the injustices of being a woman in, in patriarchal Greece with her fantastic monologue where she sort of decries patriarchal marriage and, and childbearing and the violence of it. But it's because she transgressing yeah so yeah. That, again if you look through all the historical texts we find that who is allowed to transgress the yes. norms is also very much associated with power yeah. and so it is according to the hierarchy these hierarchies were very much set and who had power and privilege was allowed to transgress these mm. norms mm. without any consequence yes. but whoever was brought lower down in the hierarchy they weren't allowed to transgress those yes. norms so even when they did it was as you say and it is a cautionary tale mm. that if they transgress these norms, it's a destabilizing effect. So Jason's a man and he's doing all that, but he has power as a man in that society to be able to do all those things mm. and he doesn't suffer the same consequence yes. or the judgment or the punishment associated mm. with it. Because yeah, his honor in yeah. that context of that society is more important than yes. her grief. Yes. Um, also, of course, Medea is othered. She's othered because of her, her race. She's othered because of her powers of, of witchcraft, of sorcery, and those two things are very linked. This is another ring of a woman who's seen as a, a barbarian. Mm -hmm. This is what she's couched as because she comes from Colchis on the Black Sea. Um, so that moves me kind of clumsily along to the next point I wanted to ask you about, which is um, to kind of transport us forward into the late, late Middle Ages, early modern period, and think about the witch trials mm -hmm. and the ways in which the witch trials were weaponizing women's emotionality against them in a very punishing sense. And also the way that hysteria as a medical diagnosis emerges out of this crisis of, of apparent witchcraft being performed by angry women. Um, there's a book that is here in the British Library by um, a 17, early 17th century chemist and physician named Edward Jordan, who um, was tasked with 
defending a woman who'd been accused of bewitching a young teenage girl. And he put forward the <laughs> hypotheses that symptoms of possession, symptoms of witchcraft in women were actually this natural disease. Again, the flapping womb is coming back. It's flapping back along. That it was the womb was sending up these distempers so that widowed women, older women, and then younger women, this sort of unmarried younger women, were most at risk because their wombs were not being used in the patriarchal correct sense. So from this literal hysteria, social panic, around witchcraft, we begin to get, in English at least, discussion of hysteria. So the hysteric medical diagnosis becomes a plausible explanation for witchcraft. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about this persecution, this huge moment of the persecution of, of especially female emotionality. Yeah, I loved looking at that book, seeing that book and writing about it. It's uh, so fascinating. Um, and, and although he wrote to support, um, defend this woman called Jackson, Eleanor Jackson, I think. Yeah. <laughs> she was called, but he, she did end up being yes. hanged, so he couldn't really save her. I was also saying uh, outside that I'm trying to, with my small children, they're just turned seven, um, I'm trying to make them <laughs> kind of flip the narrative around the word witch because they've been reading a lot about witches and one of them got scared at night that what if there are witches around. And so I was trying to say that actually witches are not always bad and witches are not bad. They're just women who are very strong. And so I'm trying to tell them about the empowered way and that that fact, and then now they think, are you a witch mummy? I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I can be. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, the whole story of, I think, the whole thing about witch um, uh, craft and the fact that they were punished, they were hanged, the, the dunking, the, uh, all that kind of thing was happened, was this public display, again, of what happens when women can't control their emotions mm. and can't, can't conform to a moral code of conduct that has been set out for them. So around this time, there were all these code of conduct books mm. that were coming out. And there were some for men, but mostly it was for women, mm -hmm. as is now that women should do this or should, did, should do this. And the women who were not conforming to those who were transgressing, again, in mm. terms of sexual liberation or in kind of women's rights were also coming out. At that time, women were started to talk about it. There were some other books that were coming out. And so there was, again, this kind of fear that this will dismantle mm. the system that they had kind of very carefully established, the patriarchal uh, hierarchy. And we see that again and again through history, but we see that in contemporary society as well. Anytime there's a fear that these kind of social norms will be overturned, people who have the power or pr who have the privilege or benefit from these social norms actually try and impose a code of conduct mm -hmm. on other people and say that they, these codes are good for our society. So this is what was happening in the, in the witch um, trials as well, that women who were um, talk, speaking of, against mm -hmm. religious, religious beliefs or women who were talking about sexual um, re liberation or showing emotions or screaming, or some of yeah. them were punished because they were caught screaming on the streets, or all those kind of things were were being public, and it was a very, this public display was the big, big part of it, to give a message to others that this is what happens. So yes. women were also reporting women as well, because they were benefiting from patriarchy in a way that if not her, that it could be mm -hmm. me, kind of. And that happens even today, you know, yes. that we, we see those kind of effects even in contemporary society. And so, um, so a lot of the witch trials were, I think, against women's emotionalities mm. and women's behavior, not conforming to these codes that men had set out for them. And we see in the notion of medical diagnosis of hysteria, um, also there was this idea that women were basically, um, and, and we know that Freudian ideas about women were um, unhappy that they didn't have the, some of the male anatomical features, um, and so they were inferior, and so they were struggling against it, and which was one of the reasons for hysteria. But at this time, also, we start seeing about how the intersectional effects were coming into yeah. play as well. So we start seeing that um, during the medieval and the Renaissance period, and later on, we start seeing that men, upper class men, had more. Um, freedom to express some of these stronger yeah. emotions, and so this range of emotions, while 
women of color, black and brown mm. women, minoritized communities, but men of color as well, were seen as kind of barbaric yes. or savage and that they didn't have as much control over their emotions. Mm -hmm. And so they were, they, 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 the, all, the, all those communities, the people, white, colonists were going into, they were representing those communities or those mm -hmm. as, as people who showed their emotions yeah. quite widely, like in terms of ta dance or song or, mm. or screaming or wailing. And that's what the representation we see in a lot of historical records for me, start looking at colonist records and yeah. paintings and writings and diaries as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so even though they're not talking about emotions, they're being judged for the emotions all the time as well. That leads me that leads perfectly into my next question, which was about this issue when the idea about who is allowed yeah. to have emotions, who's allowed to feel in the first place, really emerges into, into social thinking and into medical thinking around the 18th and into the 19th century, when it's sort of the age of emotions. You know, as you yeah. say, emotion, emotional display, what emotion is, what it can create and do is really fascinating, you know, culturally, but also in medicine, there was this big thing about where are emotions? What are they? Mm. Are, they are they something we can track, trace, feel? Are they spirits? You know, where are they? Are they little mess winged messengers? What are these things? And what you see in, in the medical literature of the time is this real attention to, with of course, colonization and, and imperialism having such an influence on systems of power like medicine, you see a real turn in ideas about who is actually capable of feeling. Mm -hmm. So in the sort of golden age of hysteria, the, the archetypal hysteric woman who was a white upper or middle class woman who had exposure to all the spoils of colonial wealth. So she had, you know, coffee and chocolate and leisure and clothes. And she was having all the, under all this nervous kind of stimulation all the time. So she was being bombarded and she was unwell. And, whereas, and then there were physicians who imagined this almost sliding scale of civility. And at the end of this scale were black ethnically diverse women, colonized women, racialized women who were deemed incapable of feeling anything. And this is of course rooted in racist biology, racist anthropology, but it ricochets. Yeah. So it's really, a myth that's really, really embedded. So I wondered if you could speak yeah. to this. Yeah, I mean, we see that those eugenic theories were basically scientific theories or myths were created to colonize people, to say these people are superior, these people are better than the mm -hmm. others. And because, uh, for instance, black women had, they, there was a whole theory around their the size of their skulls or the thickness of their skin, and they couldn't feel as much pain. Um, which meant that it was easier to justify colonization and oppression. Um, and there's all these scientific myths that were created. And if you see the diagrams from that time, um, they, they perpetuate or reinforce those kind of myths that were create, being created by the colonizers. Again, we come back to who had the power and the privilege to write these texts and to print, uh, access to printing, access mm -hmm. to public um, information and opinion, basically, so they could sway in information and opinion uh, uh, according to their beliefs and attitudes. And it becomes so di deeply embedded in society that even now, as uh, of course, that we see that that is very much rooted in, in the kind of racial bias that's in the medical domain mm -hmm. about how, and, and how the impact it has on who gets diagnosed and who gets treated and the wide dis racial disparity in, in our medical and healthcare mm -hmm. domain as well. Um, but at that time, yes, I mean, it basically, even though it's kind of um, the, the, the fact that it's being racialized and yes, black women could feel all these emotions, for instance, black and brown, brown and minoritized women couldn't feel as much as white women. Mm -hmm. But it, it is still a kind of a benevolent sexism and notion yeah. of what they were trying to um, protect white women from um, being swayed by their emotions yes. and not performing their role as child bearers or giving yes. uh, or having children. And especially because at that time, women's rights and suffragettes and women's rights were mm -hmm. coming up, um, they were worried that, that 
women, white women in particular, were not having as much children, and that links in very much to the white, the great replacement theory, because there was this idea that the minorities, because they were going into these communities where they, they had these beliefs, and I write a little bit about in my book, Motherhood as well, about it, about how they thought that black and brown women or minoritized, colonized women could have children very easily. Mm. And so they were giving birth very easily, and without, and they could recover and start working in fields the next day, they were writing in their diaries, but also the fact that they had large families. Mm. White women, on the other hand, were considered frail and fragile because they were not as strong, sturdy, their skins were not as thick, or their skulls were not as, as small. Um, so they felt more, and they were worried that the better people um, were be, were be, would become less in our society, and that happens even now, the, the whole idea around reproductive justice, and mm. um, it, the, is this fear of great replacement theory about the fact that white women are not giving birth. So by protecting them from those kind of external stimuli, there was also a, a, an attempt to protect their, the, the racialized hierarchy mm. in our society mm -hmm. as well. Um, you mentioned reproductive justice there, yeah. and of course, you know, we've seen over the last year, especially the way that there is this real kind of retrenching of the idea that women are reproductive units mm -hmm. and that our emotional relationship to ourselves in terms of our mothering, our individuality is again being called into question yeah. by systems of power who want to do exactly what you're saying, which is entrench a a hierarchy, a reproductive hierarchy. Um, and as you write in your introduction and throughout the book, and I know this is something that's very important to you, we know throughout history that when women express emotions, that they can be seen as unstable and they risk losing body autonomy and agency. And just recently, in fact, just in the last couple of days, the, the politician Stella Creasy was um, reported to social services by a man who yeah. believed that her outspoken feminist beliefs were a danger to her children. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we also know in the States, I'm not sure if it happens here, but there are, are women, especially women of color, who fear reporting feelings of postnatal depression or postnatal mental health because there have been many cases in which children have been attempted to be taken away from their mothers with these perceptions of maternal fitness coming into question. Um, so I wonder if you could think, or sorry, if you could talk a little bit about your feelings about this connection between gendered emotions and c the control of bodies specifically around, around reproduction. Yeah, I mean, it's such a, it's such a deeply important topic about how controlling women's emotions is is an attempt to control their bodies, mm -hmm. very much so. Um, United Nations talks about that everybody should have bodily autonomy in their agenda. Um, they don't mention that everybody should have emotional autonomy as yeah. well, um, but it, those are very much interlinked in terms of who's allowed to take decisions, make decisions about their bodies. How valid their own opinions and, as are, and often women's opinions are invalidated by calling them hysterical or, or over excitable or over emotional, and that's been the case through history. We see that in historical records, we see that in contemporary society, we see in medical domain as well. Mm -hmm. And you give the example of Stella Creasy, and that's another attempt to, one, monitor what maternal emotions should look like and what women are allowed to say and speak, but also keep women out of the public domain yes. and have opinions because that has always been the kind of no patriarchal framework. Uh, the whole idea that because men were more rational and logical in control of the emotions, they were allowed and had the ability to make important decisions while women, because they were overexcitable and not in control of the emotions, they were not capable of making important decisions, mm -hmm. and that's very much linked to, in workplaces, how leadership um, <laughs> bias that we see as well. Um, so um, we see that women are not, and this notion of gravitas is also, again, linked to hierarchy mm -hmm. as well. Um, 
And so in terms of a kind of a, um, go moving away from aut autonomy, but yes, um, this the, again, there's a racialization in it. Yes. And, um, um, and I have personal experience of it. I've felt deeply uncomfortable uncom talking about the fact or saying anything that I was struggling with motherhood or early motherhood or I had any um, uh, mental health mm -hmm. uh, aspects or issues because I was very worried about the judgments that are imposed on, especially as a brown woman, mm -hmm. um, on, on me about my fitness or suitability to mother, even things like very simple things like if we are going for a trek or a hike, um, I fear, I, I face more pub public judgment in terms of what I allow my children to do, for instance, if they're shouting or screaming. I've been told go back where you come from because if you can't control your children or the fact if they need to use the toilet I always ask my husband who's white to take them into the trees of wishes because I'm, like, I'm not doing this <laughs> because I know that I would be judged more as a brown woman instead of as a white man because he has the power the privilege um, and and that kind of privilege to do so so I, I do think that the notion of how we navigate our space and our world mm -hmm. is, is as, as people, the, our bodily autonomy and our emotional autonomy are very much interlinked and the kind of judgments are, that are placed on us are very much interlinked as well. Very much. Yeah. Um, the uses of anger, we, we, you touched a little bit on, on suffrage there, yeah. which is of course another example of sort of coincident with the witch trials of yeah. women's emotions being, especially women's emotions being weaponized against them and uh, women's political, social work in, in public space activism being sort of pathologized and reduced into this, you know, hysteria. There mm -hmm. were so many articles in the newspaper around the time of the, of the fight for women's suffrage yeah. that would like, these women are just hysterical virgos yeah. and you know they're all suffering from some nervous instability and they will you know leave us with armies of wasted spinsters that you know need so there was this real this fear of again of any sort of mobilization mm -hmm. because the power of of emotion is known right this is yeah. why it's so fit yeah. this is why it's pathologized this is why because we know that it's so powerful that it changes the world. But also the collective power is much more, it's, it's, it's got power, the collective notion and collective rage, yes. um, especially in women. And, and when we mobilize that together, as individuals, we might feel like we cannot take, on, we cannot navigate the world and break those, uh, step outside of social norms. We can't transgress those norms mm -hmm. sometimes um, in workplace, in society, at home. But the collective power yeah. is, is something that Petrarchy fears, you know? Yeah. And that's why then women got together against reproductive justice, this outpouring mm -hmm. of kind of anger against um, abortion, uh, taking of abortion rights around the world, not just in the US, but in other places. What happened in Iran recently, the, um, the collective power yes. is something what patriarchy fears the most. Mm -hmm. And I think when we mobilize that, we've seen it time and time again, that is what, that is how we can actually um, seep in, that can seep into the kind of our individual subconscious mm -hmm. and we become more empowered to step yes. outside these codes that have been set for us. Um, so I think, yes, I, I do think that, that mobilizing that collective power is something that we need to do time and time mm -hmm. again. And, and ag again, I, I think the why people fear that is because around these ideas of social contagion as well, and the yeah. witch trials were that yeah. as well, that if, one, if, if this idea spreads, then people are be women are becoming more hysterical, mm -hmm. and hysteria especially was linked very much to social contagion. Um, and that everybody will start behaving like this, mm -hmm. and then how are we going to control and oppress them, you know? So. <laughs> um, throughout Hysterical, you really brilliantly explode this myth that there's anything natural or biological or evolutionary about the gendering of emotions. This is very much social, cultural constructs. Um, and learning about how our emotions become gendered, I think is crucial, as you, as you point out, for imagining an equitable emotional future for all genders. So I wanted to know, how do you envisage an equitable emotional future? <laughs> 
what I does it look like? Yeah, thank you so what much. Is um, yeah, what does uh, it feel like? I do think that we need to shatter this, dismantle this binary of masculinity and femininity. Mm -hmm. First of all, because when we are trapped into that, then there are some ideas of what is masculine and what is feminine are so deeply entrenched in our society mm -hmm. that children from a very young age start conforming to this notion of what a girl should behave like, what a woman should behave like, mm -hmm. what a man should behave like. And that the moment that you don't do that, you're judged for it, but we also internalize those expectations as well. And there's a lot of research which shows that even now in workplaces, certain attributes are considered masculine and certain mm -hmm. attributes are considered feminine. So men are supposed to be, have gravitas, men are supposed to be self-driven, uh, motivated, authoritative, all those kind of things. While women are, are nurturing, are collaborative, all those kind of things which are very positive emotions, but they're always considered inferior mm. in terms of leadership um, capabilities. So when women, and, and that's why we see women don't have, are as men, much represented on boards or in leadership positions. And there was a whole debate and discussion we can do around uh, what happened with Jacinda Ardern or Nicola Sturgeon and how that manifests in our society as well. So I think dismantling those ideas of what is masculine and feminine so that when those kind of morality aspects associated with it, those kind of superiority as hierarchical aspects associated with emo uh, are, are dismantled along with it as well, which means that every person has the freedom to choose who what emotions we feel and how we express them. Mm. Um, and it seems like a bit kind of, uh, oh, it's going to be such a chaotic world that we <laughs> live in that we, we are going to all show our emotions. But I do think that those ideas, those binary ideas and those rules that we establish in a society also establish those kind of display rules in our society. Because we ex experience emotions, but we always re regulate and suppress them according to the display rules in her. So right now, if I'm feeling extremely angry, I can't start, I mean, I can, but I can't start screaming right now because <laughs> I feel like, okay, this is a professional uh, <laughs> domain. I have, there are certain display rules here. So we always kind of monitoring these display rules, but we also know from research that women are hyper aware of these display rules because they know that there's more judgment and punishment associated with them transgressing those display rules. So once we start dismantling those ideas or those binaries, which is so deeply rooted in our language, in the words we use, in the images, everything in the media, political messaging, we then actually start challenging those display rules that have been set in our society. And so we start becoming more egalitarian and individuating people rather than pushing them into groups like, okay, so this is a black woman, so mm -hmm. we can associate an angry black woman trope with her. Or this is a man, so boys can't cry, and mm -hmm. it, it, that he's being feminine if he's crying. Or that if a woman is showing angry anger, then she's being hysterical. So those kind of labels can be dismantled along with that as well. Um, and I think once we start owning our emotions and being able to have a healthy language around our emotionalities, then perhaps we move towards a more egalitarian world. Thank you so much, Pragit. I'm sure that there are some brilliant questions. Hands are going up, is what I like to see. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm going to go in what I thought was an order, so forgive me. Um, we have a roving mic coming, so this... You, that, with the beautiful head, hair band. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much for being here. One of the things that I was most horrified um, to read after the 2016 election in, the America, in America was the number of white women who voted for Trump. Mm -hmm. How do we build a coalition with women who, well, seem to be benefiting from the status quo if it's that coalition that change will depend on? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. Thank you so much. Um, I do think that, yes, when we talk about women, obviously not all women are equal and there's a hierarchy within women and we have to start acknowledging that as well, that some women benefit more from patriarchy or proximity to patriarchy as well. And I, I do think that wh white women perhaps benefit more from patriarchy because they don't face those racialized uh, racialization. Um, and and the associated judgment and penalization and punishment that comes with it. So I, I do think that within even like within data science, I think we start sometimes looking at data and I start looking at data and I see that 
in diversity, inclusivity initiatives, everything women and men. So people think that if we have appointed 40% women, we are doing really well. But some women, white women, benefit more from it. For instance, as an example, there are around 20% prof women professors in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, the data might have changed in the last two, three years, but only around 2% two, 2 of women of color. So we have to start disaggregating that data and start looking at the kind of intersectional aspects. And I think that's where intersectionality comes into it as well. As to your question about coalition, I think that can only happen when people, every person starts acknowledging their privilege and mm -hmm. saying that even though I'm a woman, I have certain privileges. Even though I'm a brown woman, I have certain privileges compared to others. And again, intersectionality comes into it. So I suppose this discussion has to be intersectional. Um, everybody has to start acknowledging their privilege and saying, how do I leverage my privilege to help others who don't? Uh, am I benefiting from patriarchy? And there's a lot of internalized misogyny yes. because we grow up internalizing those notions and norms and saying there's nothing wrong with it. And we know that even in my book I wrote about um, in Germany, they were trying to figure out sat navs um, and the voices a while ago. And a lot of women thought that they wanted a typically traditional masculine voice because they didn't like a woman giving them orders about <laughs> where to go. So, <laughs> So that is again a form of kind of internalized misogyny because women think men are be make better leaders and there's research to show that as well. I mean, it's a long answer to your question about how do we build coalition, but yes, we have to start thinking about what our privileges are and how we leverage those. Thank you. Was there any questions? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm blinded a bit, so I'm, if I miss anyone, so it's a question here. Thank you. Thank you. It's been amazing to hear your thoughts on so many issues. I was just wondering about how these ideas of gender emotions, particularly within history and mythology, ties into how we approach uh, the LGBT community, particularly lesbians, and our attitudes towards lesbians historically, and maybe the different way, the way we always consider them other women, mm. uh, and the way we ignore them frequently, within, particularly within politics. I was just interested in your thoughts. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's again, again, the intersectional aspects of it. And again, I think that very much links to these kind of very narrow ideas of what a woman is and what a woman's role is and how a woman is supposed to behave. And I think our patriarchal framework is very heteronormative because it benefits patriarchy. Um, and so, so there are always people or women within the group of larger group of women who are pushed to the margins and fringes because they're not conforming to those kind of social codes of heteronormative um, society. Um, I do think, I mean, it's not an area that I've done a lot of research in, but I would say that when you start looking at the intersectional aspects and discussion around those ideas of what a woman is, they are very much linked to the, the, the template of what a woman is also very much linked to a white um, woman. So even when we think these are biological facts that a woman has certain level of testosterone or certain level of estrogen or certain level of that, those narrow confines other a lot of women as well who do not conform to them because they, are, uh, they belong to different ethnic groups or different racial groups, but their behaviors might be different as well or the way they dress, the way, all of those kind of things in, are linked very much to our perception of what a woman should be like and mm -hmm. how it should look like and should act like. Um, yeah, I think that's that's kind of my response. And there was, a, if I may, there was yeah. just a, it, when before hormones were named as such, and when when um, what would now be called en endocrinologists were thinking about these substances in the human body that kind of contributed to the, the essence, you know, strength to, to to you know sexuality to this sort of this essence of, of human and. And when um, doctors were thinking about what these things were, they were very much coded as masculinizing yeah. or femininizing. So, s feminizing, feminizing, feminizing. So, some of these uh, sort of late Victorian doctors were talking about what we now know to be estrogen and testosterone and saying, you know, there is this, again, this kind of sliding scale of femininity. So, a woman with the most estrogen, or what they called then, you know, the female sort of glandular substance 
was very nurturing, passive, silent, you know, loving, plump, lovely cheeks, big breasts. And women who lacked the estrogen tended to be ambitious, <laughs> smart, not want kids. Um, more you know, masculine, all the, more yeah, masculine. and but so coded more masculine. So yeah. this, it was always on this sort of scale of nurture, the, these sort of idealized patriarchal feminine qualities. So I think that that really played into the idea of how, at least, how I know about it through med medical history, <coughs> of how you know lesbian identity was conceived of in a sort of pathological sense of a kind of lack of this feminizing. Yeah, I think the closer to you know? masculine notion yeah. of what they thought of as ma again, it's yes. very much linked to those binaries of, and even now when we talk about testosterone, I everybody talks of them in terms of male hormone, but mm. actually women have testosterone yeah. as well. You know, it's not that is just a male hormone. Right. So I think those b scientific myths or yeah. kind of misconceptions very much contribute to that. Very much. Well. And it was, you know, th these science often emerges with myths first, yeah, myths story and story storytelling first, and that is, has huge sticking power. Um, I have a question from one of our audience members online. Um, throughout history, were menopausal women viewed as being more or less likely to suffer from hysteria and wandering wombs? So <laughs> menopause is not something that was talked about quite a lot mm. openly, but it was it was very much linked to this kind of notion of grandmother hypothesis. Yes. Yeah. Um, that after a certain age, women had to stop childbearing mm. because they had to kind of look after the children that their daughters were bearing. Yeah. So they, they were supposed to be grandmothers mm. and, and pass on their kind of genes um, and carry on the race, so the survival of the fittest. And so they had, they, they needed to have certain kind of role to still survive, to be alive. Otherwise, if they're not looking after children or having children, what is their role in society, really? Mm -hmm. So what is their value? So um, yes, I think older women were seen to be more hysterical because obviously they, they were dried up, shriveled, all those kind of things that were used in, for them in, in historical text. Um, they didn't have as much feminizing hormones. Mm -hmm. they, they weren't as close to the feminine ideals of reproduction, reproductive powers still mm -hmm. their value to society. Um, and so older women, widowed women, um, women, younger women who were not married having sex or having children, all of these women were more likely to encounter or fa have hysteria and hyst be hysterical. Where's the so I think we went one, two, three, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, thank you for doing this. It's so important. I think just even t having the information out there for women to read uh, the history of it might empower women to continue to tell their own stories. Yeah. Um, just, I don't even know where to start. I have loads of questions, but I'll only I might ask two. Um, mm -hmm. As a reader reading your books, it made me really angry and I had to put the books away for a little while and hide them <laughs> and take them back out. So as the writers, how did you mind yourselves writing these books? And the other question, what was my other question, was about menopause. Do you think we're in the midst of a revolution where women's health care is concerned? Um, and just your answer on that one as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Yes, I, as I say in the book, this book might make you sad or angry or neither or both, everything is okay. And yes, I do think that we, and when I do a lot of research and I read about it, it makes me extremely angry. It makes me extremely sad at times. I feel all those emotions. Sometimes I have to really um, also reflect on my own biases and prejudices as well. While I'm writing, I have to reflect on the language. These injustices are, are too heavy. It's a heavy burden to carry and I think it, sometimes you have to hide it away, <laughs> not come to it, take a step back, look after your mental health. Um, it's an exhausting process, and I'm sure you'll agree, Elena, it's an exhausting process to write about such topics. And I keep saying that I'm going to write a really funny book very, <laughs> very soon where I don't have to think about any of these things. And, and I'm going to just write a really, f which I'm sure is exhausting in its own way to try and be funny. But, uh, but yeah, I do feel like when you feel so strongly about something mm -hmm. and if you don't write then it has to be said as you say and if it mo mobilizes women other women to share their stories and i think that's one of the biggest like happiest 
thing for me when women contact me and say, actually, I felt seen or I felt heard or I felt that I can share, talk about my experience as well. I think that's really fantastic. And in terms of your second question, in terms of menopause or generally about women's health, I do think that conversations opening up, like yeah. my mother, motherhood, like choice, like yeah. bodily autonomy, mm -hmm. like the ability. To, so we're challenging some of those things, absolutely. Um, I do think still we are not talking about it in an intersectional way. I don't think we're talking disaggregating the data. So even when I was writing motherhood and I was looking at infertility data in the UK, that was 2020 when I was writing it, 2020-21, um, the data was still not disaggregated in terms of in women's infertility. There was no data on black or brown women at that time about how many went through in IVF cycles. And I think as a brown woman, I've going through some of those infertility struggles, I felt very alone and isolated because I didn't see anybody like me or talk, being talked about me or the, even knowing that I was not alone. And, and similarly about breast cancer, similarly about um, menopause as well, I do think that we need to, be, without going into biological essentialism, we do need to talk about the intersectional aspects or, or, or of it. Um, yes, we are having some racialized discussions but we keep talking about the same thing and repeating the same thing, like the fact that black women die four times more in maternity and childcare. We've been talking, repeating the data for five years now, four years, but nothing, what happens next? I think that going over that hurdle and talk, taking the next step is a big thing. And I do think that policymakers have to come on board and the government has to come on board. I mean, that, there is actually a question from an audience member online asking about this exact issue that black women are four times more likely to die during or after childbirth and as you say this is i don't know how many reports yeah. and articles appear in the press since i think it was 2018 there yeah. was a report the royal college of Ops and gynae put out this huge report and you know the government were kind of said well we should do something and you know it's we are now so much more aware of these discriminatory biases yeah. and the way that they affect People say it's time now for, it's a way overdue time for genuine policy change and real action. Um, so yeah, we know, but what ha exactly, as you say, what next? But what also, as next? you say, Elena, this came out in 2018 and I wrote about it in my book, Sway, when I wrote it in 2019. And since then, um, I've been doing, I've done more research in medical textbooks and we realize actually this is not something that can be just tackled on one front. Yeah. It has to be tackled in you know, all systemically and structurally because even in medical textbooks, this language, this discriminatory attitudes are so deeply embedded mm. in the way that um, pain is talked about, the way that women feel pain or not, or the way they, they over exhibit their pain. Yes. Um, and, so, and some women are seen more, or the fact that some women can give birth more easily, so they're not giving as much pain relief during childbirth. And those medical textbooks, the language, the way that doctors are trained, the healthcare professionals are trained, that has to change as well, I think, because those are the people who are going to make real change. I think really if there's you know, genuine systemic change needs yeah. to happen, it also needs to think about the way that these enduring social and cultural biases yeah. sort of uphold um, policies and biases in systems like medicine where people's lives are at stake and you know feel like the only way forward maybe is to completely rewrite yeah. medical curricula by people who are most affected you know at the intersections of these biases um, thank you for a great question Yeah, you talked earlier on about working on human-computer interfaces, mm -hmm. and I, I guess one of the things that's coming up there is the modern fashion for artificial intelligences and the danger of gendered biases getting into how those things are trained. I was also one, wondering about sort of science fiction stories when men create artificial beings, from yeah. Hephaestus making Pandora all the way through to films like Metropolis and, and Ex Machina, where the, the man creates an artificial being in the form of a woman, and this is a robot, so you would think that it would be devoid of emotions, but somehow, having been gendered female, it ends up being unstable and dangerous. 
thank you so much for that question. Absolutely. And uh, one of the last chapters of the book, Hysterical, is about emotional AI. It's about sex robots. Um, it's about how that is getting ingrained in our technology. And I think that, for me, besides all the historical text and reading about chamber pots, was one of the most difficult chapters for me to write because I had to trawl through some of those forums and read some of those discussions and comments. And it's actually, I'm feeling very just chill, just talk, thinking about it because you think this is what's happening now. It's not historical. This is not in the past. This is what's happening now and this is what's the future. What does the future hold for us? So yes, I wrote an article about emotions and emotion AI in Wired magazine recently. But technology and bias is something that I'm really deeply interested in and I've worked on for quite some time about racial bias and gender bias and wrote about it in Sway in my book. But yes, I mean, the, the idealized notion of womanhood that's being created through those sex robots, through, through, through the machines that are being created, the behaviors that are embedded in, even what we see in, in media and films and in TV are actually um, a danger, a threat because those are the kind of synthetic women are kind of being um, portrayed as this idealized, as I say, idealized women. So what are the, what are the consequences for real women um, about in terms of our expectations and norms around them? And that's a question that I raise here as well um, about how do, we, how do we make sure technology is free of bias, but also how do we challenge some of these idealized notions or behaviors that are being embedded in these sex robots about, um, and I'm all up for sexual liberation, but it's, it's something that we need to question if they are designing these robots um, in, in very idealized traditional feminine attributes of passive, passiveness, mm -hmm. of, uh, of just serving the, the man. Um, and those behaviors and norms will get seeped into. And at the moment, it's a very small thing. It's not so widely spread, but there's a real danger as we go more into towards technological development and advancement. We, we've seen that widely in even the voice uh, assistant systems um, about how they were feminized, about how they were to design Alexa, Siri, they were all designed in a very traditional feminine way of women being subservient and serving men and serving others. Their role was that. Um, there was also a whole report done with the United Nations and we did some research in the fact that when these, these voice assistants were given any kind of sexual harassment statements or any kind of a sexually explicit commands, they did not stand up or retort. They were designed in this kind of very passive uh, form model. And the most, I think, Alexa or Siri, one of them said was, I'd blush if I could. Oh. And that is mm -hmm. it. And so we looked at across all the number about, and I think some of that has changed. Uh, Microsoft has done some work on it. But those, again, the notion of traditional feminine attributes and what the role of women is in society is being seeped, is seeping into the technology as well. I think we might have time for one more quick question. Sorry if you didn't get your... I think there's yes. somebody at the edge. Yes, there. yeah. Okay. Sorry if you didn't get a chance to answer, but thank you all for brilliant discussion. Um, oh, now I feel it's a real <laughs> edge of responsibility here to end. <laughs> yeah, end on a high. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. Um, as someone who works in the field of education um, and spends quite a lot of their time with young people, um, there's a real kind of interesting, I suppose, I don't know, schism or dichotomy, I'm not quite sure what the right term is. With a lot of the young people that I work with, they seem, in comparison to, and forgive me, I don't mean to sort of cast aspersions on the audience, I think most of us are out of secondary education <laughs> and university. There seems to be a real kind of, with some of the young people that I work with, their views around LGBTQ plus or trans, it's almost like they sort of look at older generations as if to kind of go, what, what is the big deal? Which, which is fabulous. Like, you know, the idea of around pronouns, they just, they're kind of like, oh, yeah, okay, that's how they choose. Mm, chill out. Which on the one hand is wonderful, but simultaneously with the just sheer overwhelming access to things like social media and this almost kind of like enforcement of expectation. And it's not just with adolescent girls. I mean, that is by far and away the thing that is discussed mo most mm -hmm. in the media and the such like, but we see it with adolescent boys as well, mm -hmm. this notion of emotions and regulation and expectations mm -hmm. and the such like. And I'm just interested in your thoughts as to 
how do we, as people who are, I suppose, you know, did not live that experience of this constant bombardment and constant mm. access to what societies all over, on the one hand, are championing and wanting to push forward around exploding these myths, but simultaneously, you also have at the click of a button people really doubling down mm. on these expectations yeah. around how women yeah. and men and those who do not feel they occupy either of those mm. spaces, um, how how we should, I mean, also, as I say, check our own biases and privilege, but how we help younger people navigate that yeah. space when it really is a kind of unknown world. Yeah, thank you so much for that brilliant question. I Something I obviously feel very strongly about as an educator, as a as a parent, and I, I, I work with a lot of schools and universities on, on this. Um, yeah, absolutely. It, the new generation gives me a lot of hope and optimism. I'm so hopeful and I'm so energized by them whenever I speak with young people because they're just like, it is, like it's not a big deal. Just respect people's identities, you know? And they can d dismantle some of those things, but there is a lot of, there's a smog of misinformation around them. People like Andrew Tate um, was not the only one, but there are other people and they have access to this on TikTok talk on Instagram um, around body image, but around those ideas of what is masculine, how to be a man, how to be a boy um, are very much like, uh, but those ideas are passed on in a very kind of benevolent way. Um, so I was in a taxi after actually the launch of Hysterical, I was in a taxi in London and I was talking to the taxi driver about, he asked me, why are you here? And I said, I just did a BBC recording for this about gendered emotions. And he said, what do you think what Andrew did? And I was like, how long do you, uh, do you have? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he was like, but you know, have you ever listened to him? He actually mm. says some really good things about, about how to look after women and how to, I was like, but do, do women be, want to be looked after in the way that you want to look after them, you know? And so we had a discussion for 15 minutes, but it gave me, um, gave me a lot of thought in terms of how they pass it on in a very benevolent way as well about that we're doing good for women. I think that how do we help them navigate is by developing criti to critical faculties. I think critical thinking skills are so, so important that curriculums don't handle, schools don't really have time and energy to invest in. But from an early childhood, if we, if we help our children understand that any information they get, they can't just absorb it without yeah. critically analyzing yes. the social, cultural context. Who's saying this? Why are they saying this? And be skeptical. I think a little bit of skepticism <laughs> is good in children. Good. Um, it does become wearing when my own children start asking me like, <laughs> why are you saying them? Are you sure about this? Like, I'm like, don't apply those rules on me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> But I think critical thinking is so important in this age of information, misinformation, but also more information and knowledge around fake news and misinformation, how to handle this barrage of information, mm. because we know that we cannot rationalize all the information we are getting. So yes, I think critical thinking in the curriculum probably, and also talking to them. Well, thank you so much. Uh, you've been an absolutely brilliant thank audience. You. I'm sorry if you didn't get your question answered, but thank you all for your fantastic questions. And to say a big round of applause to Dr. Pragya Agarwal. Thank you. Um, Pragya, Elena, thank you so much. Really fascinating discussion. I, I work in the pregnancy charity sector during the day, so I read all these reports by birth rights and five times more and Muslim Women's Network on the disparities in, in maternal deaths and stillbirths, and it's really shocking and it's going backwards. Yes. Not, it's not improving. Maternal deaths went up last year for the mm. first time in a long time. And um, it's very, to answer your question, my, my usual um, way of dealing with it is like four glasses of white wine, um, <laughs> but it's, it's getting angry as yeah. well is really, really important. Mm. And, and spreading the word as well and making sure that it's not just an echo chamber of people within sure. the pregnancy sector. And those reports are, are led by black and Asian minority mm. ethnic women. And it feels like, yeah, it can feel like that echo chamber that yeah. everyone's just talking to themselves. I'm it needs answer. to get out there. It needs to get as much publicity. And hopefully the government will do more than just silence on the subject yeah. at some point yeah. next year when they're voted out. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs>
Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, both Eleanor and Pragya are going to be outside signing their books. And of course, if you're watching at home, um, you can buy copies online. We can't magic you a signature across the airwaves. But um, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who's um, sat and listened to today's talk. Um, you if, you, if you have any photos or any thoughts or any questions, um, uh, we've got the hashtag HistFest2023. And you can tag us at HistFest UK as well and have a whole big history conversation. It'd be wonderful. Thank you so Thank much. You. <laughs> Take care. <laughs>